Thanks for joining us. I'm Steve Hsu. And I'm Corey Washington, and we're your hosts for Manifold. Our guest today is Adam Dines, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Brigham Young University. Adam studies legislative behavior with a focus on representation, distributed politics, and political parties. His research examines the behavior of U.S. elected officials at the national, state, and local levels using surveys, observational data, and experimental methods. He's the co-principal investigator of the 2012 and 2014 American Municipal Official Survey, the largest survey of U.S. local officials conducted by political scientists with over 4,000 subjects, and the first to employ survey experiments with this novel population. Welcome to Manifold, Adam. Yeah, thanks for having me. Our topic today is your recent paper, Noisy Retrospection, the Effect of Party Control on Policy Outcomes. Uh, and I have to confess that uh, after reading your paper, my motivation to go out and vote in state and local elections was somewhat reduced. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it was not my intent. Uh, can you explain to us what is retrospective voting? Yeah, so retrospective voting is this idea that um, it's both like a normative claim and a positive claim about how the world works. On, on the, the, the positive side, you know, the positive side, positivist take is it's about um you know do people vote based on the past performance of of the candidates or elected officials or incumbents who are running for office and you know in its purest form you're just you know the idea is that a voter shows up and they are just rewarding or punishing the party in power for how things have panned out and in particular often the the economy right um and then there's other work that says, you know, retrospective voting could also be used to make judgments about how a candidate or, you know, incumbent is going to behave in the future, right? So you can say, oh, well, if the economy has done well in the past under this party, if I vote for them again, maybe the economy is going to keep doing well. So that, that's kind of like the, the positivist, this is how the world works um, idea of retrospective voting. Normatively, it's an argument about how maybe Voters don't need to be as informed as we think they do in order to uh, create accountability in the elections. Because the idea is, oh, you know, you don't need to know that much about the candidates. You don't need to really even know their platforms. You just need to know which party's in power and how are things going, right? Is your state or country, your city, are things going okay? Are crime rates down? Is the economy growing? And if so, then reward the party in power. And if not, Punish them, right? That's the that's kind of the gist of it. So, what's the question you investigated? So, under underlying this idea for of retrospective voting is that the elected officials in office are going to make decisions and change policies and do things that will impact the economy or impact crime or other like social outcomes that we might think voters should take into account when they're voting, um, especially retrospectively. Um, and so kind of our question here is, well, in the timeline of election, so like in the two to four years after uh, a party comes into power or a new governor and you know comes into office or a new majority in a state legislature, do we see evidence that they have an effect on the economy and crime and other other outcomes like do we do we see evidence that they're impacting the very outcomes that proponents of retrospective voting say uh, voters should take into account in casting their vote so you look at a huge range of policy outcomes i think 28 of them yeah plus there's another i think we ended up with 45 because we did some additional ones some of it that didn't have as, as wide of coverage years wise but yeah we we try to be very comprehensive can you give us the kind of highlights as far as the policies, the most important ones you think? Yeah, so some of the ones that are gonna be most important are the economy, uh, measures of economic performance. And, and the reason for that is because those are ones that a lot of the research on retrospective voting looks at, right? Um, and this is especially the case for presidential elections, but also governor elections, gubernatorial elections, congressional ones, of trying to, to see, do, do voters punish and reward um, the incumbent 
based on how well the economy is doing. Um, so yeah, so we have measures of so economic growth in the state. We have measures of unemployment. We have some measures of income inequality, um, housing prices, income growth, yeah, number of businesses even in the economic range. And then with a variety of crime, uh, violent crimes, robberies, property crimes, murder rates. Yeah, and so I think those are some that are probably quite key, especially, or could be really important in state elections. What did you find? Yeah, yeah, so overall, I mean, what you, when you look across all these measures, and there's some that measure health and family, environment, a bit on education, a bit on turnout. It just, it mostly looks like noise. Like it mostly looks like the point estimates, like the estimate of the effect of having, um, barely having a Republican take control of, of the House of Representatives at the state level or the state Senate or the governor's office has no effect across all these measures. Um, so whether it's the economy or crime, education, environment, we don't seem, we don't find consistent evidence that they're having an effect on any of these things. So it seems like one possibility could just be that there are many factors affecting those measurables, government only being one of them. And so even if the pol- uh, the parties did what they said they would do, and if there was a significant difference between what they would do depending on which party was in power, that nevertheless, there would only be a small effect on those observables. Yeah. So yeah. So one of the issues here is, is maybe we give too much credit to um, to uh, to government and its impact on on a lot of the, these big um, macro kind of level outcomes, right? So may, maybe yeah, we 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 forget it's a complicated system, right? With lots of different things that affect our economy and crime rates, some of which are beyond you know easy things for government to control, right? So that that's definitely a one possibility. One one. One thing you do in the paper, though, is that you actually look at persistent control, which uh, yes. has the possibility of l- restricting your analysis to cases where government might have a larger effect than if a party's just in power for, say, a four-year period. Yeah, it, it, let's say Democrats have had control of the governorship for 10 years, right, in a row. Do we, do we see effects even after that 10-year period? And the answer, we don't. I have to caution, and, you know, we do have language in the paper, you know, there, there's a bit of caution here in that. We're not, causal identification is not as strong when we're looking at uh, the effects of pers- persistent control. So when we're looking at these short-term effects, we're better able to say it's almost like an experiment uh, given the methods we're using. But when you're looking at consistent control, you know, there might be con- concerns that maybe something else is, is having an effect on things that we're not controlling for. Um, but nonetheless, it still seems to be the case that we're, we mostly see like kind of noise that it looks like the results all center around zero. And, and when there are effects, they seem to be kind of random, right? They're not consistent across our different, uh, the different models and regressions that we run. So beyond the specific results that you present in their paper, are there cases where you actually though do believe that the outcome of an election actually affect a measurable uh, societal uh, policy or outcome. I mean, I, I could give examples like 2016 election effect on immigration, 2016 election effect on budget deficit, 2016 election effect on tax rates, 28 on... election effect on insurance rates, insurance yeah. levels, yeah, health insurance. Well, I mean, so, so, yes. So some of this, I, I mean, there's a lot of things going on here. Some of it might be they implement a policy. It does have some effects, but it's actually it's kind of targeted in the sense. So let's say a state implements uh, Medicaid expansion. And you can, you know, you can say, look, we have, you know, if we were measuring number of people access to that program, it would increase. I mean, we're trying to look a little downstream to say, okay, well, even if you increase Medicaid, are we seeing some effects on like health outcomes overall? Um, And even in that case, even if I think uh, Medicaid was expanded, there there is, it could be that yes, it, it increases access. It has some positive effect for those people, but because it's like increasing access in this state by, let's say, twenty thousand people or forty thousand people or hundred thousand, but you got a state of five million people, maybe the the effects end up getting washed out because you just don't 
it, it's a small effect. It's almost like too small to pick up, right? So, th so that, that's very possible that these things still do, still have an effect. And so I, I hope, I mean, I'm not trying to say state politics don't matter or who controls the government doesn't matter. It's more of just maybe it doesn't have as big of a society, societal um, impact as we might think. I think you, in fact, get this. Uh, I think people sort of intuitively know this because many people vote on a fairly personal basis. So, you know, a, number, a large number of Trump voters uh, say they voted for him just because um, they want him to lower their taxes and they weren't particularly concerned about other things and they kind of ignored the noise that he was stating, but they thought they'd pay fewer taxes under yeah. him. And, and, and also, you know, maybe a bit what goes on too is it's changing who's the winners and losers are, but overall the economy is looking similar, right? So so let's go with with... You were mentioning the 2016 election with the election of President Trump. So, yeah, like, like it's definitely the case. They, they changed tax rates. Um, but, you know, if we're looking at the economy, but I say I've seen like real differences in the economy from end of Obama into beginning of Trump. Really? Like when I look at like the stock exchange, and I you know this isn't very sophisticated analysis. This is just me, you know, looking at uh, stock returns. It just looks like it just, it was going up at the end of Obama, you know, especially once we get, we're coming out of the uh, recession, it's going up and Trump gets elected and, oh, it just, it keeps on going up. <laughs> right. Um, but that, that, that's a very, I mean, there, there are obviously many factors affecting, you know, not to mention the federal reserve or trade relations, oil prices that are totally out of Trump's control. And I, the question is, are there not things that voters are aware of where actually the depending on who wins the election, the policies implemented are significantly different, and it seems like at least in the last election there are significant differences one could point to between what the Hillary world would look like and what the Trump world currently looks like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. It's just more like with our particular paper, you know, would I expect to see like big differences in the economy? And my answer is kind of like, eh, I'm not sure. Like, I'm not sure they can do enough. I mean, they, they could, I mean, you could go, and here's the thing, they, they could go wild and, you know, you could go uh, push policy that's going to have like wild inflation or, you know, just stop funding public schools altogether and police forces. And yeah, I think you're going to, we would pick up those effects if you started, if you went that wild. I, I would expect that to have an impact. But also part, part of what's going on here is there's constraints on what political actors do um, in that they... They're constrained, um, some of it by by re-election, right? And so this is, in some way, where retrospective voting can come in is if people try to be too extreme, they know there's this threat that they could get kicked out of office, right? If they push policy that has that's just obviously disastrous and it seems very obvious they're to blame, you know that that's a, I think that's a concern. So so even like Trump and take immigration, you know, there's not. And maybe Trump's wanted to do more, but there's also been a strong pull to the middle, right? And even some Republicans, you know, they're, they're not funding his wall, right? They're, there's, because there's plenty of Republicans in districts where they know it's not that popular. And so, you know, Trump keeps putting up a fight or, you know, having, getting upset and saying, I need more funding for the wall. And they keep passing these spending bills that don't really give them much funding. For yeah, I, I don't think either the Democratic Party or the establishment Republicans are particularly supportive of Trump's uh, views on immigration. And so it's not surprising he's having trouble getting stuff done. But some of that same logic applies here in our probably in our data as well, in our results. There's a very cynical view some people have that there's a uniparty or that politicians are just liars and what they promise in the campaign is not what they do when they actually get in office. Maybe that moneyed interests actually secretly control what's happening in the state house, you know. So in that, in the, if that were the case, if there were sort of hidden forces really controlling how government conducts its business, uh, then that would be consistent with your data, right? Because basically, it doesn't matter who gets elected. Yeah, it, it could be. Yes, but I, I'm, I'm not. I, I don't necessarily. Maybe I'm too optimistic, but I, I don't think it's necessarily because there's like moneyed interests have taken over completely. I mean, I do think they have an impact. I mean, you could argue, well, maybe it's because, you know, one argument is, well, maybe um, Democrats and Republicans are pushing similar policies on the economy and they're pro-business because they're worried about uh, business donors or these moneyed interests. You know, that could, I mean, yes, that is possible. It could explain some of it. But it's also the case that 
Democrats and Republicans do pursue different policies. So we, we don't look at this in my paper, uh, in my paper, uh, at John Holbein, but paper by some other research it does, right? Where they try to say, is it the case that Democratic, you know, almost controlling for everything you can imagine, using some sophisticated methods, if you end up with a Republican governor instead of Democrat governor, do we see differences in the policies that they push forward? And the answer is yes, right? You, you do see a difference, right? So it is the case, Republican governors, Republican state legislatures, um, when they come to power, especially even when they just barely have control, marginal control, they push for policies that move, they push policies into a more uh, conservative direction. Right and Democrats in a more liberal. So 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 that that kind of goes against that they're just totally bought off necessarily. Like they are pushing for different policies. Yeah, examines also policies that uh, relate to criminal justice, which aren't so constrained by economic actors such as big business. And as far as I can tell, the effects for on crime rates are pretty small too. Yeah, yeah, we don't we don't see a big difference there either. And some of this too could be that there's different ways to achieve the same outcomes, right? Um, so you can imagine even a bundle of policies that some actually help reduce crime rates and others are maybe actually contributing to it and they're kind of canceling each other out. There's also, I think, other bigger, even with a crime, like bigger factors that, that come into play. I mean, there's economists who argue about how basically the, the rise in crime in the 70s and 80s can be attributed in a significant portion to uh, exposure to lead paint. Right, and that the decline since then is, you know, I, I, you know, I've, I've seen serious uh, presentations and empirical evidence on that. Right, that yes, policy comes into play on that and uh, trying to ban lead paints, but like you're not going to see anyway. You're not going to see things that Democrats or Republicans are doing right now that are now affecting. Uh, how lead affected crime rates, right? And yeah, I mean, that goes back to the point of you should look at variables that you, you're sure are relatively sensitive to policy decisions by government. Otherwise, why, you know, why look at them? I mean, sunspots are probably relatively uh, independent. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about some work. I don't know if you're familiar with this researcher at Princeton named Martin. I'm not sure I'm saying his name right. Gilens, G-I-L-E-N-S. Oh, uh, Gillens. Yeah, Marty Gillens. Gillens. Yes. Testing... Yeah, yeah. Testing theories of American politics, elites, interest groups, and average citizens. Uh -huh. So yeah, 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 I'm I'm familiar with this work. So that that's a slightly more nuanced version of kind of what we've been discussing, where his claim is that regardless of citizens' preferences, average person's preferences, the outcomes, the policies enacted tend to only be enacted if the economic elites or certain groups with uh, disproportionate influence also agree with the general populace. And he, he has evidence to that effect. So it could be the case that in cases where the elites are not controlling what happens, yeah, the, what ma the election actually makes a difference, maybe in criminal justice, that's one example perhaps. But when it comes to some very sacred cows, it doesn't matter what the general population wants, uh, the elites won't allow it to happen. Yes, I, I think there's some, some truth, especially to that. And some of it, some of it may not necessarily be for nefarious reasons. Some of it could just be, oh, who are often our elected officials? Oh, elites come from upper class. Oh, they share lots of similar preferences. And they're, you're right, they're just doing the same things that other upper class people would do if they had gotten elected as, as well. Um, but I do want to point out, there are some caveats on Gillen's work. I guess it's Gillen's and Page, I think is, all, That's is right. the author on these things. In that, um, well, one of those, and you know, they, they, they admit to this, is that like on lots of policies, the poor, the middle class, you know, average, median American in terms of income, and the wealthy often agree, right? There's lots of policies where we don't see a big difference in their preferences. And so they do narrow it down on those policies and on preferences where you do see differences between the wealthy and, and middle class. And so, so I mean, now, now I think the way they would push back and they do this in some of their papers, and they'd say, oh, well, come on, Adam. Like, yeah, sure, they agree on lots of policies, maybe even 80%. So yes, we see a correlation overall between the preferences of even the poor and policy outcomes. But if we really want to know who's having influence, we want to look at it when they disagree, where do we see exactly yes. right? And that, that's where they, they, they would push back. So but I do want to point that out to make it sound like it's not like everything's just in the favor of the wealthy 
at least because there's lots of things where the wealthy and poor agree that that's not necessarily the uh, happiest, I think, uh, maybe interpretation. But, but there are some articles that try to push back, though, and say, you know, are these, are there measures of the preferences of the wealthy? How accurate are they? Because it's really hard to get to, to measure the preferences of the wealthy. Like, it's just a, it's a hard sample to get. I think there, there's widespread uh, misunderstanding of their preferences, uh, especially in 2008, because wealthier donors tended to uh, trend democratic. When you got to the very high level, income levels, where they, the conventional view was that really wealthy people were uniformly Republican. Yeah, well, yeah. But are you saying in the 2016 election? No, I was talking about the 2008 and stuff um, uh, oh, in 12. Yeah. I think there was just a conventional view prior to that time that the richer you are, the more you want your taxes cut, the more you can support Republican policies. But I think perhaps shifts in social views, and I think uh, many wealthy people may become uncomfortable with the rising levels of inequality, that a lot of high net worth people um, were actively backing Democrats and continue to. Yeah, yeah. And I think 2016 pushed that more that way, too. I mean, you saw uh, more than you used to see where, anyway, you just saw like there wasn't a big difference between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump in terms of uh, wealth of voters and education. It was starting, and some of that is because changing coalitions in the party. But um, but the other thing, it, it, I have, there's plenty of evidence, though, that wealthy definitely on taxes generally seem they have a much more libertarian view, a conservative view, wanting lower taxes, surprise, surprise. And and that matters, right? And so that that policy difference, and with the Gillen's work, you're going to see differences there. Yeah, ta- um, taxes are not obviously the only issue that separate the wealthy from the rest of the population. I mean, immigration is a good example because uh, it's generally working class people that are more negatively affected by immigration, and wealthy people just get cheaper servants out of it. So Consequently, you could imagine the elites are fine with mass immigration and uh, average people might have more problems with it. Yeah. Another thing I do want to talk about a little bit here is on the research, especially with our our project with retrospective voting. um, I mean, our bigger one of our bigger points is to say, well, if you think that voters should vote based on how the economy is doing, because it's tied, has these direct ties to things that elected officials have control over. Well, then you might end up with voters still rewarding and punishing elected officials based on out- outcomes that in the short term they weren't affecting. And it's not to say that they can't have effects on them and in the long term that they're not having effects and that these policies don't matter. It's just that in the short term, it, it, it's maybe it's not helping voters like act as if they're more informed, right, by voting based on how crime rates are doing in their economy. They might be blaming, or they're likely, especially based on our results, blaming state officials for things that they didn't affect, right? But, so, so that leads to the question of how should voters be casting their votes, right? How, you know, what, what should they be focusing on? So I'd like to focus on the first point you made, because I think it's yeah. really important. I think your idea is that there's no clear evidence that state policies affect outcomes, but people think they do. Uh, people are effectively reacting to noise, and so if you think you're voting rashly on the basis of an outcome, you may be deluded. You may, in fact, think that party A had effect on policy B, uh, when in fact they don't. And so you're systematically uh, making uh, votes based on effectively missed. Or, or maybe people are just voting on mood affiliation. and So know. that's right. A lot of people just vote party line yeah. anyways. Yeah. Um, and in some ways, our research is saying maybe that's actually not so bad, right? Or at least it's not its not any less rational than someone who thinks they're objectively assessing the evidence. Yeah, because what, what we're trying to, yeah, because what we're trying to show here is like, it's, if a voter is really trying to say, okay, I'm going to try to figure out whether I should blame my governor for what I see in, in terms of some of these downstream effects and crime and economy and health outcomes and environment. And yeah, and, and try as they might, they're, the, if they're probably going to end up blaming or rewarding for things that are outside of their control. And you know what might be better is try to vote for them based on the policies they support and what you think those policies are going to do. Um, and it turns out party is probably a pretty good shortcut for figuring that out, right? But for, how is that any more objectively rational if these policies, in fact, don't really have an effect? How is voting what policy you think might do, because <laughs> the policy doesn't have an effect, rational? Well, I think you could still argue, though, 
I'm still holding out that the part that these policies do have some effect, even if it's not big enough to pick up on like a statewide basis. So maybe Medicaid expansion isn't going to lift health outcomes across the whole state, or it's, but it, it, it probably is going to affect, it have some effects for those who now qualify who didn't before, uh, especially maybe financially. And, but maybe those additional 30,000 people aren't enough in a state of 5 million people where we're going to see it, you know, affect the overall economy or if, health outcomes. Corey, right? if you were hiring a football coach and one coach would result in a 56% win percentage and the other one would result in a 55% win percentage, which is basically impossible to measure uh, in the coming seasons, you still might prefer to hire the 56% win percentage coach, right? No, so, of course. The fact that he can't detect a difference doesn't mean there yeah. isn't one. You're going to so prefer- So it could be rational, right? It, it could it, be right. But you, but you, in fact, are probably unable to determine those right. percentages. I agree. I agree. Um, That's a but, separate question. But, but, but back to Adam's point, he's making kind of a Rawlsian point here, too, as far as I can say, which is, okay, maybe you don't focus on the economy as a whole or the state as a whole. Maybe you focus on a certain interest group. Uh, if you're selfish, this isn't the Rawlsian part. You focus on yourself. But if you're not, you may focus on the most vulnerable and say, perhaps these policies- are wash if you average over all the citizens, but there may be a small percentage of people that are affected. This is this is kind of self-serving. It's the argument I make to all my left-leaning friends who say they want to leave the country uh, when X Republican, insert Republican, gets elected. Unfortunately, they never do. I, <laughs> my view is fortunately they don't, because if you leave, in fact, uh, you're going to leave people who are really vulnerable uh, to policy changes in the country, and they're going to suffer, and you'll be in Canada with national health insurance. <laughs> That's kind of so I have to chime in a little aside here. My, my wife's from Canada and what she, she loved the thing that made, kind of made her want to pull her hair out was when conservatives were saying, if Hillary Clinton gets elected, I'm moving to Canada. And, you know, she'd have some, you know, friends who would post this and she's like, do, do they, do they not realize like, anyway, exactly. what policy is going like? They want they want socialized medicine is what they want. Canada <laughs> might have a more reasonable immigration policy than the United States. Um, it's got a different one. We can probably yeah. get into that. Yeah, but let me get back to let me get back to voters. Um, are you familiar with a book by Brian Kaplan? He's an economist. It's, it's uh, a little bit. Uh, which one? It's called The Myth of the Rational Voter. It's actually a book that he wrote, and I just want to read. I just want to read something for both you and Corey from that book. Um, in polls taken since 1945, a majority of Americans have been unable to name a single branch of government, define the terms liberal and conservative, explain what the Bill of Rights is. More than two-thirds have reported that they do not know the substance of Roe versus Wade, what the Food and Drug Administration does. Nearly half do not know what states have two senators, that states have two senators, and three-quarters do not know the length of a Senate term. More than 50% of Americans cannot name their congressman. 40% cannot name either of their senators. Voters' notions of government spending are wildly distorted. The public believes that foreign aid consumes 24% of the federal budget, for example, though it actually consumes about 1%. So I would just say that the empirical evidence is that arguing about like small bits of rationality on the part of voters is just crazy because the evidence is so strong that they're not even following the basic facts. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. So everything like Kaplan says there, it's like, yeah, amen. I, I, most most political scientists would nod and say, "Yep, that that is the state of of uh, voter knowledge generally." Um, and and this is also th this also feeds this debate about retrospective voting. And so so that there's early work, uh, this classic book, this giant huge book, The American Voter, that it came out like 1960, and it's this early work on voter trying to look at voter behavior. How are voters choosing? trying to understand public opinion, especially in the context of an election using surveys, okay? So it's just this groundbreaking work. And the authors, um, you know, very well known in political science. Now, um, they, you know, their conclusion is just, yeah, voters do not know much. They're very ignorant and mostly they see the world through a partisan lens. And it seems to be their partisanship drives lots of their behavior, even their, their preferences, right? That it's like, they are a partisan first. They figure out what party they're in early on in life. And then from there, they figure out their preferences, right, on, on policies. And so, so th this has been a theme throughout like modern contemporary political science and, and trying to use surveys and scientific 
uh, methods to understand voters that they just do not know much. And so, so early work with, on retrospective voting, and this is where someone like a, a, another a famous political scientist, Vio Key, tries to push back and say, well, the, you, know, you know what? There's this work that's trying to say voters are, are idiots, but I'm going to push back against that. And he puts forward like retrospective voting as this, this way to save voters from their ignorance, that they don't need to know much. They just need to know is the economy doing well. And so that, that's so this debate that we're chiming in on and that, you know, the, your quote here from Kaplan is, is, is you know, part of that, that ongoing debate. Can voters overcome their ignorance? Can they use shortcuts? And we're trying to say, well, retrospective voting isn't going to save us from the ignorant voters. I think people who have a kind of cynical or realist view of the state of voters' knowledge and rationality, you know, when they look at the I, I'm sorry if I'm not saying his name right. Is it Gillens? When they look at the Gillens results, they're relieved because they say, okay, these voters don't really know anything. And so when they disagree with sort of potentially better informed elites, I'm actually relieved that the elites actually get their way. And, uh, you, you know, maybe you get better government from that. Yeah, but that comes up in my classes. It probably, now some of this is, is with my students. Like I, I've, we, we've talked about the Marty Gillens readings from time to time in, in some of my classes. Uh, uh, and that, that's often what comes up. Now, of course, you know, being a professor at Brigham Young University, my sample of students probably looks a little more conservative than uh, undergrads at your average university. And this is also what, right, as often is brought up is, well, actually, I feel reassured <laughs> for the very reason you say. Now, some of it, I wonder, is like, well, are you reassured is it because you, you like the wealthy making decisions or is it because they're pushing policy in a direction you also like, you know? So it's hard to separate those two. But there is, I think there is a concern is that there are some issues, um, and this is where even if voters are very ignorant of lots of facts about politics, even if the who controls state government is having an impact on policy outcomes in the short term, so retrospective voting isn't going to save us from their ignorance, I still think, though, there is the case that, you know, there are some things where you don't need to be informed and you're but a, a ton about politics, but your opinion is going to really matter. Right. So imagine, you know, like when, you know, pretend there is a country where states are actively oppressing certain groups within the state. Like, I don't know, like, you know, segregation. Right. Um, I, I and think about in the South and the civil rights movement. I, I think you could go back and say. Let's measure, you know, political knowledge among African Americans in the South. Now, we might be surprised. Maybe it was actually quite high, as, especially as they're mobilizing. Um, but even before then, I think, you know, what would I say? Even if I found that survey evidence and found, oh, they, you know, their knowledge about who their senators are, well, they don't really know. They don't really know that, that they have two senators. I'd still say, yeah, but I'm still happy they're voting because on this issue, you know, they have a lot of information. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's I think it's fair to say that democracy, even if you paint it in this sort of very negative way, it it, relo- it does create a safety valve release. So if the government yes. is really tanking the economy or it's really um, oppressing a certain minority population, people can sense that it's a very macroscopic thing to sense and then vote these guys out of office. So so, you know, I think everybody who likes democracy would say, you know, it's it will always have that uh, positive feature. But, but I think Adam's result actually rationalizes people's not paying attention to the details of politics. If, in fact, there aren't very many differences, you should, you should focus your cognitive energy someplace else. And look, in, you know, we've had, we have a running kind of um, discussion on the show about the culture wars. People focus on art censorship. Um, they focus on abortion. They focus on lots of cultural issues. And um, to some extent, your results actually make that seem sort of rational, because if Party control is not going to affect the economy, not going to affect policing. Uh, it might actually affect these other things. Maybe it doesn't, but at least they're an open possibility. But people are reasonable not to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to vote for Trump because he's going to prove or disprove the economy because that's probably not going to happen. But he may affect X social issue that I care about. So, in fact, people may be pursuing what's thought to be kind of a bounded rationality approach to politics. Uh, think about the things that matter. Don't uh, 
learn stuff that's not really relevant. M- many is the cab driver that when you talk to them, will say, oh, these politicians are all the same. Nothing's going to change. Why do I pay attention to it? I'd rather just, uh, I, I'll, I'll follow the Red Sox because I like the Red Sox. And, and it's not irrational. I, I think even from a purely utilitarian e- economic perspective, what are you getting for your vote? You're going to spend a bunch of time reading stuff, educating yourself, and dragging yourself to the polling booth. Uh, what do you get from that? You're barely influencing the election. You're one, you know, ten millionth of the electorate or something. So even from that perspective, it's not particularly rational to vote. Well, and, and even what you're pointing out here, uh, Steve, lines up probably. I, I, I suspect Kaplan, you know, would be nodding his head and and saying, "Oh, and why is it that people are so ignorant? It's because perhaps deep down, they know their their vote's not going to change the outcome." Right. But there's lots of things where your decision does change the outcome. Right. Like your decision of what thing to buy, your decisions of how much work to put into your job versus something else, how much time to put in to a relationship. Yeah. Is is outcome consequential. I, I don't know if it's Kaplan that makes this point. Maybe it's some other people. But what's interesting is if you ask someone to say they've lived in a particular state for 10 years and you ask them to analyze, well, who got elected and what did they do and did it improve or not? Generally, almost nobody can give you that analysis. But if you ask them, how was the football coach at BYU for the last 10 years? They can actually tell you like, oh, four seasons ago, we went to the went to this bowl, and but we lost that, that the guy dropped the pass. That wasn't the coach's fault. And they'll give you incredibly detailed, nuanced analysis of that, but they can't give it to you for politics. Then that kind of counters just what I was pointing out, because it's like, in what way were their decisions related to the football team consequential for the outcome. Well, it's, it's it's mood affiliation. I mean, they like it. It's it's not that they're getting a, a tangible benefit, but they just like it. They're really seriously interested in Happiness it. is pretty tangible actually. Yeah, um, exactly. So I think people people, you know, move towards pleasure, avoid pain. Yeah, they like it. And um and, and other thing I do want to point out about this like so this this idea is called it it's 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 rational to be ignorant, right? It's rational to be ignorant. Um I, one thing I do want to point out, I, I don't think I, I said it in a way as if, as if somebody is re- really realizes their vote doesn't matter. But I think the op- maybe, you know, most people, there are plenty of people who vote and act as if they think their vote, uh, their one vote is going to change an outcome and um, rarely ever will, very rarely. Right? But I do think if you found out that an election where it's going to come down to your vote, oh boy, I, I think a lot of people would suddenly like, ears would perk up and they would probably start they have a lot, feel a lot more pressure to know what the heck is going on. Yeah, I agree. So what do you guys think of this uh, pretty conventional philosophical argument for voting, that if you vote, you're taking, uh, you're you're participating in the body politic, you're involved in civil society. That's an intrinsic good to uh, take an interest in civic matters. Um, independent of the utilitarian consequences, we should all try to be part of the polis, and this involves informing yourself and engaging in your civic ritual. Yeah, I think as an ideal, that's very laudable. Uh, As a realist, though, I would say the fraction of people that are going to achieve that is quite small. I often will think about it, like in my classes when when I teach about why do people vote and, and who ends up voting and why are people voting? Is it rational to vote, right? Is why do we think about it as, as informed voting as a public good, right? We, we would all benefit um, if people were participating and were doing so like well-informed. Uh, but unfortunately, it's also a big collective action problem because this is a public good and thus it's not in anyone's individual incentive to become informed or actually really even to, to vote necessarily, except we, uh, you know, we have all of these uh, psychological benefits we get from voting and there's part of me and my students, usually their reaction is, so you're telling us we shouldn't vote, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I'm just like, well, no, I'm not. I still vote. Maybe that is just weird. And maybe it's because I, I am maybe clinging a bit to what Corey has said here. And I'm still trying to say, well, there's this, there's this public good here. And I'm going to try, gosh darn it, I'm going to be a public good provider. I'm, I'm just, I'm going to try to do my part. And and try to be knowledgeable and, and show up, even though I know my vote's not going to change the outcome. And I'm going to try to resist my, my partisan biases and, and this whole, uh, you know, kind of tribal politics and rooting for my team um, and voting for my team just because it's my team. I'm going to try to fight that. But 
I'm not sure in the end, am I making the world better by, because ultimately lots of people who end up voting, they're not going to do that. <laughs> they're going to be into social pressure. Um, but I still hold on to this. Adam, I'd like to ask you a historical question. I don't really know the answer to this, but uh, it sort of came up in a previous podcast that we did. The claim was that uh, after the fall of Athens for over a thousand years, democracy was typically referred to as, in negative terms, as sort of irrational mob rule as opposed to rule by wise people. And that that was sort of just an accepted cultural value for a long period of time. And we have a different cultural value, but who says that we're actually getting better outcomes? Uh, like, wouldn't that be a very uh, sort of base reality thing that would be difficult to check? So is, is that history actually true of how people wrote and talked about democracy for long periods of time? I mean, so I'm not a, I am not an expert on Athenian democracy, just this big disclaimer there. I'm not, I, I can't say I'm a big expert on the founding, but you know, I, I, I teach quite a bit about it in my intro, especially American politics courses. And you know, I've done my, my readings on it. Um, it, it does very, very much, is, it seems, is the case, especially among like, for example, the founding fathers, they're very skeptical of democracy, right? It's almost a swear word, right? Where they're like, no, we don't want democracy. And they're thinking Athenian, um, it's, the people are the rulers and they're, they're deciding, you know, maybe we have a lottery and we choose people at random and they are, they are the legislature and they're choosing things. And, you know, they, they definitely had big qualms with that, right? Um, uh, from the standpoint of concerns about mob rule, right? And you'll see a lot of this in, in their writings, especially James Madison, and, and these concerns about anarchy and concerns about the passions Right, and how can we bridle these passions, or the passion of factions, for instance, right, of of, of groups that are able to uh, oppress others and rise up in power and push for policies that are against the public interest, and that's a big concern of theirs. Right? The the context in which this topic was it sort of tangentially was mentioned, we didn't have time to delve into it in the other podcast. We were talking to someone who was kind of a China expert, and we were talking about cultural differences and why certain cultures were you know, at a given moment in time, we're, you know, willing to assume that democracy was by far the best mode of governance, whereas some other thing like maybe technocracy with regular polling of the population, which is, in, one could argue what they're doing in China now, might be better. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things I was saying is it's, it, it's not clear to me exactly why certain cultures or groups of people just accept a very primary assumption about what's better working better or not working better. I mean, it's probably simply their historical, their political tradition. And that's the most obvious explanation of this. People accept what's gone before. Yeah, and, and that's even the case in the U.S., right? And so even though I just said our oh, founding fathers were very skeptical, especially about like mass democracy, especially in the sense of like Athens, they are still, though, have had over 100 years history in the U.S. of having representative democracy, right? Um, so that's starting with uh, colonial governments, um, and then developing into colonial legislatures that look very much like the state legislatures we even have today, but also back then that developed into those state legislatures as once the U.S. is, uh, you know, breaking free from uh, Great Britain. And so they have a lot of experience, right? And they, they, you know, even coming from England, this idea of a representative democracy on some level, even if that representation is, you know, it's it's the elites in your town and some lords who are in the House of Commons and also lords in the House of Lords, but they're still, they've had hundreds of years of this, right? Of this idea of having people, elites chosen in some way by the people or that are supposed to be somehow reflective of people on the ground in some way making decisions who aren't, um, Anyway, so that, that's important. And I, I think, you know, there's arguments that the American Revolution, right, is, is a conservative revolution. It's going back to kind of what they had before and kicking out, just saying, hey, England, stop doing these things. We don't, like, leave us alone. Um, <laughs> let us get back to what we were doing, right? And then that, and then it builds over time, right? And we constantly are expanding democracy. It's constantly kind of building little by little from there. I think that, you know, the modern, sort of the way that people in the West talk about the rise of the West in the last few hundred years, you can point to multiple factors which could have contributed uh, to their success, industrial revolution, use of markets. And the third one is 
democratic rule. And I guess what's being questioned now because of the rise of China is whether that third one really is absolutely necessary uh, or could be replaced by something else. And I think that- Yeah, that's there's a- arguments. You have to have the economic development first, and then now you can afford to have democracy. And and you have this middle class, right, that is demanding it. And and, and then, you, then you get it. You get, get rich first, and then- but I, I think one could even go further and say even uh, – so back to the end of history question, even at the end of history, you might – after you're a wealthy, technologically advanced country, you might still not want the crowd, the mob, the people who don't know how many senators they have to be uh, deciding policies for your country. And maybe you only let them be a kind of safety valve so that uh, if you find they're very, very dissatisfied, then you then you you know react to that. But in general, you have a bunch of technocrats making all the decisions. So I don't want to push the relativist point of view, but presumably this argument is being, this arc is being made from some point of view, right? Is this the argument made by the leaders of the country saying it's better off to have the public not involved? Is this a being, argument being made by an economically dominant uh, non-politician so I well the the debate that I'm discussing is actually mainly between sort of political theorists from both the West and from China. So increasingly you will have forums where political theorists from both sides are debating their the merits and demerits of their relative systems. And it's now a serious discussion post Fukuyama that oh they, maybe there's this other way to do things. It seems like there always has been another way to do things because the the proof, the evidence that democracy was really that great, I think was never really there actually. You didn't have a control case, actually, yeah, to, right, uh, compared right. to when you do now. Well, because uh, you have so many other factors going on. You could say, oh, America thrived. Yeah, America exterminated an indigenous population, took over a whole continent. Um, how could you not thrive if you were doing that, right? Had free labor uh, from slaves. Yeah, for... free labor from slaves. You know, so, um, you know, it's not clear which of the factors that favored America made America so great. You know, was democracy really the key ingredient or was it not? I think that case has never really been fully made. Uh, and now it's being sort of vigorously confronted by people who are from a different system. I, I, I give a lot of credence to democracy as this, at least it's the safety valve. And I, anyway, we didn't do anything about surveillance state on here though. And it's uh, the uh, pluses and minuses. Of, of- it, it's funny because, uh, you know, as far as I know, the NSA is actually hoovering up, but you're in Utah, right? There's there's some uh-huh. huge data center near you which is storing. Gee, what's it storing? If you do some back of the envelope calculations for how much data they're storing, they're basically getting everything. And um, you know, oh, who's in who's living in a surveillance state? I guess we probably don't know. I I have a couple kind of technical questions to ask. Um, I mean, one, one sort of aside, right? So I just want to throw something out to you guys that maybe the main motivation for voting is not so much that you think your vote's going to change anything. But in the case of, say, um, high-stakes national elections, you're trying to mitigate the downside risk, the very tiny downside risk that your vote, uh, your not voting, causes the other person to win. And I think people are just, they know it's unlikely, they know it's it's almost certainly not going to be the case, but they don't want the person who did not vote and then Trump got in. I'm just throwing that out there. That may be a possible motivation. Or, um, or Hillary. Or Hillary. Or Hillary, yeah, possibly. Um, yeah, well, so, so some of the psychological, psychological benefits can be, one is rooting for my team, and I feel good. Like, I went out, I did my part, and yeah, I go team. Like, it's showing up to the game, right? And maybe your team's not that great. You don't like them that much, but you really hate that other team. And so, yeah, you, you did your part to boo against the other team and, and you know, voting... So this partly unifies the explanation of why people care about football and politics. You know, at some level, it's uh, it's the same team. The second thing is your paper focuses on state uh, elections, uh, and you don't do national. Is it just because there's not enough data at the national level to get a fully powered study on this topic? Yeah. So a big part of this is you know with, with the methods we're employing, we need yeah we needed a, a we needed a, more observations, right? I mean, we need you know with fifty states for. 40, 50 years, you can get a lot more statistical power to get at these things. Um, yeah. And so there are questions like, does it translate up to the national government? Is that kind of what you're getting at? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's some reasons to uh, to say it may not. Like, the the at the same time, the one reason we think that the, the, the state or national government has so much influence on the economy possibly often is because of the Federal Reserve, which is actually very, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Very, very sheltered from... It's quasi-independent. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so there's part of me, so some might say, oh, well, the federal government's where all the action is. Okay, well, one, they're not actually lately not passing that many, as many policies or, okay. but, but then a lot of their biggest lovers, they have actually delegated right, to the Federal Reserve. So I, you might expect to see some similar results, right? And you have the similar constraints where voters, or sorry, elected officials are thinking about the medium voter, party leaders like Nancy Pelosi, she's thinking about her moderate, uh, her, her, sorry, her representatives from swing districts and how does she keep those people there? And which all makes it so the policies you push may not be so extreme, even though Democrats, Republicans do different things, but maybe not as extreme as you might, people might think and say. And then, anyway, so I, I wouldn't be surprised to see similar results if I could, if I, uh, if I could have the same data at the national level. It, it, it does seem to me coming, I, we sort of went, I sort of went through a list at the beginning of the podcast that there are there are a lot of issues where the two parties really would try to do very different things and then the question would be are, are the things they do really impactful and on topics like immigration budget deficit tax rates federal courts gun rights abortion rights brexit to take a european example um or not european example a british example um whether they whether the british uh, would adopt the euro instead of keeping the pound the, the, these are ones where I think there really are clear impacts, most people would agree, and the government, the, the parties are very polarized in which of the policies they favor. Yeah, the deficit's kind of an interesting one because uh, it used to actually divide Democrats and Republicans, and now it either nobody seems to care or yeah. it seems that it's actually intra-party where there's actually some divergence on, yep. um, Absolutely. on that issue. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you could argue very strongly that Trump in, blew up the federal deficit. Um, you know, Obama did it, but he kind of had to do it because of the financial crisis. Yeah. Now, some of it is because we're on autopilot with our spending and the federal budget, right? Yeah. Like, and, and when I say autopilot, what I mean is they're not doing uh, appropriation bills in the tradition, traditional process. It's just these continuing resolutions and like, okay, well, and especially if uh, your continuing resolutions are from things that were done during a financial crisis, when you're trying to stimulate the economy and expand spending, well, I guess if we're on autopilot from there, that's where our starting point is just going to keep on expanding. And you, you can really see where the uh, OK Boomer sentiment is going to get really heated on this topic because yeah. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. your son's generation is going to face the music on this deficit in a very serious way. Yeah, they're going to say, okay, millennial, or I'm a, okay, I'm, I'm a barely a, a Gen Xer, I guess. I barely I make the cutoff. Yeah, we're at the upper end. Yeah, too, we're so. old Gen Xers. Um, I want to get into something super nerdy. So if, if we're done with the interesting, fun stuff, I kind of want to do the stuff that virtually nobody cares about, which is you work really hard on your statistical analyses to make sure your findings are robust. And I think it's, um, for someone who's, a nerd on the reproducibility crisis, it's, it's really heartening to see somebody work as hard as you do to try to get every angle and make sure your effects are real and stuff. So I just want to, yeah. I don't want, I don't interrupt to go into the stuff that like maybe 10 people care about, but I think it's really interesting no. if someone delves into the paper. I, and my co-author is here. This is, this is a, this is near and dear to his heart. Is it fair to say this is a little bit of a legacy of kind of the impact of maybe the influence of economics on political science that you're very careful about uh cr you know defining instruments properly and um you know checking for causality and things like that is is that what you're talking about Corey? or um yeah he just he, i mean he adam can go into the details but he runs a couple of different models but he's very concerned about the about whether uh you know you have something that maybe there's an effect there but maybe he didn't look far enough out maybe the effect did not appear under one model but he looks at another model he also looks at um, i mean He's just extremely concerned that his results uh, effectively reproduce. Yeah. I mean, the the, ex the extreme limit would be to pre-register and say, I'm going to do this analysis <laughs> when I get the data, and I'll be convinced this way if I get this result, and I'll be, yeah. Yeah. So so some of it, yes, we have concerns about replication crisis, right? This idea that lots of our findings, it's, you know, 20 people do a regression. One of them are going to find, you know, <laughs> each gets their own sample, does the regression, one of them's going to find a statistically significant effect, right? And uh, concern, especially in psychology with, you know, these uh, experiments with small n, that mostly what we're just seeing are is that that spurious results, and the other ones just don't get published, it, right? Yeah, it's or, not even 20 different groups do different regressions. It's like you're secretly doing 20 regressions in your office, yeah. and then you're publishing the one that came up. Yeah. yeah. 
And, and so and some of this is because it's hard to publish null results yep. too. Yep. Um, and so, so, so some of this is when we're like, okay, we have a null result. We're like, we know even in the review process, it's going to be hard to get that published. So we are just going to, we're just going to hammer it home and we're going to try to look at it up from every angle possible and just keep saying, look, the story's the same, story's the same, story's the same, story's the same, story's the same. So some of it is realizing going in that there's a bias against no results publishing those. And so we're going to have to really sell it. Um, What's interesting and, is that in your case, though, the no result is in some sense the interesting result because it goes against conventional wisdom. Yeah, it's not, it's, it is nice. So that, that is a nice thing sometimes when you have a research project where whether you get the no result or the effect, it's still interesting. Uh, unfortunately, lots of things we care about or lots of things that reviewers and editors care about don't fall into that bin <laughs> of uh, they find the null result interesting. Um, and so anyway, so some of this though is, is in a way it's necessary we, we, I mean, we do have concerns. We want our things to replicate and we wanna show that they can replicate. But in a weird way, it re also relates to the replication crisis because there's a bias towards not publishing null results. So we're like, okay, fine. And we are going to just hit you over the head um, over and over again with our 100 plus page appendix and our code that took, it takes like 45 minutes or so for it to run on my computer to go through all of the regressions that we do to, to produce. It took a long time doing, making, <laughs> uh, running all of this. Do you think your um, approach, the level of rigor you take is uh, now normal in the field or, or are you kind of an outlier? Um, it's, it's becoming more and more normal. I think we're still a bit of an outlier, and some of this is most is again because we're trying to sell a known result. So yeah, unfortunately, I mean, but it is more and more a norm to make your put your data up online, make it available, right? That that's most journals now are just saying, hey, okay, hey, we accept you for publication now. Where are you putting? Tell us where you're making the data available. So that that you know, I think that helps. Too. That, that's a that's in the, a step in the right direction. What kind of reaction have you gotten to your findings? Um, well, so far, I mean, one of them is like, so you're saying politics don't matter, and so you have people like, well, parties matter. Obviously, parties matter. What? And <laughs> so some people, you know, push back in that way, and you know, and it's a similar conversation I think we've had that that we end up having with people. It's like, well, we're I mean, they they don't matter, but at the grand scale, maybe not as much as people think. And, um, the other is there is a concern to some of these people say, oh, well, this shows retrospective voting is working. Maybe the reason you find the null result is because, aha, they know they're going to be punished for a bad economy. So they're all putting in the same effort and doing the same things, right? So, boom, you've proved retrospective voting is actually happening. And that seems our pushback, and, and, and we, we push back against this in the paper, it's a little subtle. I probably should have had bigger flags around it because this is the common critique we get. But our pushback is say, yeah, but there's pretty strong evidence that they, they propose and actually pursue and pass different policies. Now you might say those policies aren't extremely different and maybe that's the pressure of retrospective voting or medium voter theorem on what they're, what they're proposing. But they do, like to the extent that this fear of being punished for the economy or bad crime rates um, affects their behavior and makes them pursue, put more effort into those things, their effort looks different. They are pursuing different policies. And so, so anyway, so th those are, I think, the, the bigger- Not to push the positivist trope too much, but uh, the idea of retrospective voting is essentially a positivist idea. You put a hypothesis to what the party will do, the party doesn't do that, uh, your hypothesis is falsified, and you punish them as a result. But I would say that that response you got is effectively um, to make the theory unfalsifiable because either result you got would, I mean, under the scenario you laid out, the person who's pushing back at you, right? Um, either result would seem to support their view. I mean, they're claiming that your result supports their view and the alternative result was all, would also support their view. So it seems like they're effectively violating the fundamental edict of positivism, which is your result should be falsifiable to at least some degree. Yeah, yeah. So yes, on some level, yes. I mean, this is often a problem in rational choice and you know some of the economic theory building is that they always, well, this is actually why things don't fall in line with the model. Um, you know, people do that with their data results too, and you know, they massage it till everything lines up with what they want to see. But it's uh, but at the same time, um, 
it is tricky when you think in equilibrium, you won't see an effect because of a process that's happening. Um, those are hard. Those are hard to test, right? And I, I think sometimes that really can be the case in some things. Even I'm trying to think: is it falsifiable? I mean, I guess you'd have to get into the into the nitty gritty of the mechanisms, right? That lead up to no effect. And in this case, I think there's research that does that and says, but the mechanisms show that they're not doing the exact same things. They're doing different things. The parties do sl at least slightly, moderately. They're doing different things. So. Anyway. It seems that what the voters should do, um, I'm trying to take a moral from this as to how rational voters should act going forward. If they read your paper, read others in the literature, if you want to be rational, what should you do? And it seems like you should try to take a survey of papers on policies, try to identify those policies where there's evidence that there is an effect, and the focus exclusively on people advocate those policies. They're likely to have a significant effect size rather than worrying about the policies that are likely to have um, non-detectable effects. Does that seem reasonable yeah. as a? Um, yeah, but but there are lots of policies. That, there's some pretty rigorous, exper uh, almost experimental evidence of some policies having like positive effects. And our papers are necessarily saying those policies don't have an effect. It's more of just at the grand scale, is it like going to push the whole economy forward enough for you're going to see at the state level? Probably not. But yeah, I, I think if you're trying, my thing is. If you're trying to be a rational voter, well, one, I guess there's a question, should you be voting? But let's say you decide it's a public good and I'm going to get psychological benefits from doing it and I'm going to create those benefits for myself so that I have some incentives to do this and, and be informed. So imagine this, this magical voter who rarely exists. Um, <laughs> I, I think, yeah, the, the ideal would be to say, okay, what are they proposing? And is there decent evidence arguments that these you know, that one candidate's proposals are going to be better for the world, right? And I think for a lot of people, it can narrow down to a party, right? Like, at least in my sense, like, I'm often, okay, Republicans often push for this here in Utah. Democrats are pushing for this. And generally, I think these, these bundle of policies are going to be better. And, oh, look, this candidate's a Republican. That's they're probably going to vote in these ways or support a speaker in the legislature who's going to help push policy in that direction. And then... So yay or nay, right? And that, anyway, that's my my spiel, my take. Well, I think we're about out of time. Um, Steve, do you have other questions? No, it's been great. Thanks a lot, Adam. It's been really interesting.